Okay, knock it off. Let's get started. <laughs> Just so I remember. Uh, I don't know any of you, and you don't know me, but a couple of years ago, uh, I retired as the uh, chairwoman and professor in journalism, and uh, Adam Weiner, some years before that, was a student of mine, and as was John Herman, who talked to you a few weeks ago. And Adam uh, uh, Roth is uh, stranded in Europe right now, and he's asked me to, uh, to introduce Adam Weiner to you. Uh, Adam graduated in 1987. Was anybody here born in 87? <laughs> That's scary, isn't it? I didn't mean to make you feel old. <laughs> Adam is the only student I ever had who invited me to dinner. And I don't know if you remember this, but you and Dave Shento decided you were going to have me over to dinner. And they, uh, Adam was living in a little beach house down in Narragansett. Probably somebody in here lives in that now. And he invited me over. They invited me to dinner, and they said, "What do you like to eat?" And I said, "Oh, I don't know." They said, "Well, tell us. What do you like to eat?" I said, "Well, steak, lobster." And they said, "Okay, we'll have surf and turf." So I bought a brought a bottle of wine, and I think they were old enough to drink. <laughs> <laughs> and they made surf and turf and we had a great evening and they have been and I've had some great times with a lot of students over the years only ones who ever invited me to their house for dinner the other story Adam Adam was one of my favorite students for a variety of reasons he was fun he was smart <coughs> and he got great internships and he's going to tell you about some of them and they really led him to where he is today and he is somebody today uh, he was somebody at URI, too. I had him back to the university about 15 years ago, at least, to talk to uh, the journalism majors, and we had the ballroom in the union, and we brought everybody in to hear what Adam had to say. Well, first of all, his train got, to, uh, got delayed because it was a rock slide or something on the Amtrak uh, tracks in Connecticut. He, uh, he got here, and one of the stories that he told the students, which he's not going to tell you today, and I want to tell you, and then I'll turn it over to him. He, he almost left journalism. He was sitting one night uh, on the overnight desk, CBS News, and he's watching the live feeds from you know all over the world, I guess, the satellite feeds coming in. And all of a sudden, he looked up, now it's in the middle of the night, and he sees President George H.W. Bush, uh, Shrub's dad, as at a dinner in Tokyo. And all of a sudden, he goes blah and falls into his plate. And Adam said, oh my god, the President of the United States has died, and I'm the only one here, and I've got to deal with this. And what you do, call somebody higher? Oh, I call a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and he said that was one of the, at the, to that point, though, he's probably got lots of other scary stories since then. One of the scariest stories uh, that he was involved in, uh, in news. Uh, Adam Weiner, yeah. do your thing. Okay, thank you, Linda. <laughs> thank you, thank you for having me. Um, and thanks to uh, the School for extending the offer. Thanks for uh, Linda for all your support through all the years that I was here. Um, I loved the school. I had a great experience here. Um, and it was really, it was a little smaller than it is now. Uh, back then there was no Harrington School. Uh, all the, the journalism school was its own thing, the communication school was its own thing, the film thing was its own thing. They were just disparate groups uh, and they were part of the arts sciences curriculum, but they were not an organized group. So it's sort of interesting to see how it's all evolved. And uh, the resources that you guys have now are significantly better than what we had then. Uh, although I can tell you that uh, one of my professors was probably better than any one of you have, and that's, uh, that's just me being, me being biased. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my career uh, and uh, what, um, you know, some of the Specifically, some of, you know, I'll tell some stories, of course, but specifically some of the lessons that I learned through my career uh, that I think that are universal sort of truths that could be applied, and uh, you know, that, uh, some of which I knew already, but until I actually lived them, I think that it was, you know, they were just sort of 
concepts, and then suddenly they became, oh, that's that's really a way to, that's a, that's a life lesson that people should know. So, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So, uh, uh, this is just a little teaser. Who the hell is Mata Renew? Obviously, you can figure that out. Mata Renew is uh, uh, that's me. Um, and uh, um, you, you're going to. I just wanted to lead with that because it's a it's a little suspense, and it, it, you'll find out the answer at some point later in the in the, in the, in the presentation. But uh, you know, it's just a little little thing to keep you keep you interested while we continue. But uh, as we as we move on here, uh, I just want to talk first that journalism. Um, the idea, the concept of journalism was something that I always was interested in. All the way back to fourth grade. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the on-the-spot news paper that we did. It says issue one up there. We never did another. <laughs> and uh, 1975, that was a long, long time ago. Uh, I was the assistant editor. And uh, most of the reports were um, people's poems. Uh, there were some sports reports, if you want to call them that, uh, and I had the only real interview hard-hitting, asking the tough questions of the crossing guard, <laughs> um, getting to the bottom of it, asking the gotcha question of, did you, have you taken any sick days? The answer was no. So, but uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I don't want to say that fourth grade I got the bug for journalism, but I certainly, um, knew that it, you know, it was on the radar and reporting and watching the news and reading the newspaper was something that was happened in my house and when I was growing up and I knew that it was a thing that was, it was a job. Um, but really, the linear story of my career starts right here. That is an Apple II Plus, which is the first commercially available <coughs> Apple computer that ever was put out on the market. I own it. And uh, it was a result of my uncle, who was sort of a computer visionary, and he lived with my family. And we bought this thing, and I can tell you that it changed my life. It changed my life because I got into computers in 1978-79. So I think that we had a computer then before this one, but then this one came out, it was like 1980. So nobody else had computers personal computers then. It was a very rare thing, right? So I was programming, I was actually learning how to program. And my uncle was teaching me about this thing and it was really uh, fascinating. And I found it this liberating thing. I was incredible, it was so liberating and fun to me. And uh, I could see myself, I could see the possibilities in it of what I, it could do. Um, and, uh, and then uh, as I progressed through high school, I realized that I did not want to go into computers because I didn't want to be trapped behind a computer the rest of my life. That's the little to no vision part. <laughs> because if I had any foresight whatsoever, I would have realized that this would have become pervasive. And my iPhone is a computer. And we are all living with them in front of the, the reporting techniques now, the things that you can do it, it have evolved. A computer is part of everybody's life. But this thing really did change my life because it opened doors for me that didn't exist um, for what I was trying to do. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Um, I, the next computer I got was a Commodore 64, if you want to look up in the uh, Wikipedia of something. It's, it was sort of like the first cheap, um, really mass-produced uh, computer that was sold to the masses. You could plug it into a TV and do stuff. And I got one as I came to URI, the summer as I came to URI. And I was really the first person, that was really the only person that I knew here at the school who had his own computer. This was 1983. <coughs> And I made money by typing up people's reports. Because <laughs> I was pretty good on the keyboard by then, because I'd been doing it for six or seven years. So I think they call it keyboarding now, as classes in high school. Uh, back then, it was called typing. Uh, but uh, I was, uh, I was my, my most nimble part of my body is clearly still to this day remains my fingers uh, just edging out my brain, I think. Uh, hopefully, um, but when I got to when I got to URI, uh, I can tell you that um, I immediately immersed myself in 
in trying to figure out how I was going to write for the good five cents a car. And as a freshman, uh, I don't know about the pecking order now, but when you come in as a freshman, you know, you're, uh, you're a newbie. And you, you know, there's a hierarchy. And, you know, the senior editors, they're the people who sort of run the show, along with the advisors from the school, including Linda, who advised the paper for many years. Um, but I, I, I was not having any of that. And I was going to figure out a way to get my name no. And so um, I published a couple of, I got a couple of uh, stories that made the, f made the front first, the lead story of The Good Five Cents Cigar. That's one of them there, who theft said common in the dining halls. Um, that was actually not the one, I couldn't find the actual one, I, it's somewhere in my storage space, of the one that really, really was the key that my freshman year, and that was a story about how the student union, which brought in movies every Friday night, was going to bring in Caligula. Does anyone here know what the movie Caligula is? <laughs> okay, Tom, <laughs> briefly. Well, it's, uh, it's a movie about the torture uh, and uh, uh, excess during the Roman era. Yes. And it was controversial because it was sex, sexual. It was controversial because basically it was sex rated. Yeah. Um, it, was, it had major stars in it, and it was about Caligula, who was a Roman emperor. <laughs> it was the fifth or sixth Roman emperor. But it was an X rated movie coming to the student union. <laughs> okay? So I had this, I had a source on the entertainment committee. <laughs> and uh, I got him to spill the beans, and uh, we uh, we went with it. And does anyone know who that guy is up there? Anybody here? No. That guy, Linda, who was he? President Ted Eddy, and the cigar called him President Eddie Eddy. President Eddie Eddy. His first name was Edward. Edward Eddy was the former president of the University of Rhode Island. He was the president while I was here. These stories, the one I just told you about and that one, did not make the administration look very good. So I got a call from this guy saying, could you come meet me? <laughs> the pre Imagine the president of URI calls you and says, come meet me. Right? So I go to see him, and uh, he said to me, Excellent reporting you're doing there at the cigar. <laughs> and uh, you know, you're a smart kid. Maybe I could use a guy like you. And uh, maybe you would like a, a job. Do you need a job? Well, what 19 what year old doesn't need a job, right? So he said, I could use you as a student advisor in the president's office. And I'll pay you. You're going to be privy to all of the internal political discussions of the of the office, whether or not that was true. That's what he told me, and you can uh, you'll help with some of the other people who work for me. There was a guy named Dan Seymour. I worked very closely with him, and uh, what I realized very quickly was it was a quid pro quo. He said to me, "You can have this job, but." You're going to be privy to things here. You can't write for the paper. OK, so I can't write for the paper. I'm a journalism major. I need clips. I got a couple clips already, including the, the Caligula one, which was picked up by, I think, UPI at the time. So I sort of made a regional push there. Um, and I had a couple clips, and I was able to do a couple things through the years. But I said to myself, OK. I looked at him, and I said, I'll make you a deal. I won't write for the paper. You are going to be my number one reference coming out of school, the president of the school. And he said, you're on. I don't know how I had the balls to negotiate that deal with the president of the university right then, but I did. And uh, sure enough, I got the job. And, um, and Ed never spoke to me again. Ted never spoke to me again. 
and he left me to one of his, uh, his, his counterparts to help to, to run my life there. Um, but I remember when, I, when that deal went down, I went and saw Linda, because it was in my sophomore year. I went and saw Linda and I said, this is what's happening. And she said, you need clips. And I said, I know, but I have a couple already. And she goes, no, you need clips. You want to work in journalism. You're going to need to show that you have clips. And I said, well, I'll, I'll get some more through the years, but it's enough. There's, they're not going to be hard-hitting reports. But I'll do some magazine feature writing stuff. I'll do other stuff, maybe, which I did. And so she told me not to do it. I disregarded her advice. It was possibly the only time I did it, and uh, and moved on. Um, so the life lesson I think on that one is just that sometimes you gotta you gotta forge your own path. You know, Linda told me no. It made no sense for me to to sell out my future sort of to silence me, but I knew that this was only going to be four years of my life where I was going to have a career after that of decades. So I, I made, the, I made the, the, the balance in my mind and I said, let's go for it. During that time, I, um, I was really keen on getting to New York City. I'm originally from Brooklyn, uh, grew up outside the city, and I was really keen on getting back to the city. And uh, I began a campaign and that campaign was to work for this newspaper. This newspaper, for those who don't know, the Village Voice, for, through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, was the premier weekly newspaper, liberal-voiced newspaper in the United States. I, I don't even know what to equate it to, to this right now. I mean, maybe the maybe HuffPo leans a little liberal now, but like it's it's very difficult because of the fractured media landscape to understand what this is, but uh, what the equivalent would be. I mean, the voice still exists, sort of, but it's more of a New York thing now. Um, but my my uh, my goal was to get this get this internship, and um, so at the end of the, my sophomore year, uh, in the spring semester of my sophomore year, I found out who the person is who was re responsible for the um, hiring of the interns at the Village Voice, and I spoke to her and began communicating with her about it and she said to me, there is no way in hell you're getting that internship. That's all I ever need to hear. <laughs> so sure enough, between my sophomore and junior year, I did not have an internship in the village voice. But following that summer, every single week I would call this woman. Every week. And talk to her. And I got to know her so well. We talked about our families. I sent her flowers on her birthday. <laughs> it was, uh, she became this person that was more than just, I became a person to her that was more than just a, a, a student looking for a job. It was like I, care, I gave her advice, she gave me advice. Um, and, you know, I was a New York kid, Brooklyn. She was, I think, from the Bronx. So it was sort of this like, yeah, yeah, hey, um, sort of feeling. Uh, but ultimately, when the time came for my jun at the end of my junior year, and I said to her, okay, what's up with the internships? And she said, you're the number one choice. What do you want to do? That was it, right? All the other kids that I was th there with were guys from like Columbia J School, Yale, or coming from the West Coast, Stanford, prestigious sort of places, right? And here I am, the guy with the number one pick. So I said, well, I'm fascinated by politics. I want to get into pol political reporting. My goal was to cover politics, preferably international politics. If any of you read the bio, I think it was done on the American School site, you know a little bit of that story. But ultimately, I wanted to work in politics, so I, I, I said to her, I told her this, and she said, well, you could work for a guy in New York who's doing New York and or state stuff or New York-based stuff, or we have a guy who's the Washington correspondent who writes only national and international commentary, you could work for him. And the benefit of that is you get a desk, because all the other interns basically work at this like long table like one of these, whereas this guy has a desk, but he's based in Washington. He only comes in once a week to deal with the editors on the day of the deadline. So you would have your own desk. So I was like, I'm in. Jim Ridgeway, who was a as radical left-wing guy as you're ever going to meet politically, I began doing research for him. And so here are some of the stories that, you know, this is one story, his column was called The Moving Target, and uh, this story here, The Contra Guard, actually 
sort of made some big news nationally and got picked up uh, by all the major newspapers and broadcasters. So um, that was, so the lesson here obviously is persistence based, right? I mean, it's if you want something, you have to make it happen and you just don't sit on your laurels and hope it happens. Try to develop the relationships with the people that can make it happen for you because that's what this is really all about. It's all about relationships and people. That's all this is. Um, going back to Ed, Ted, Eddie in that office for a moment, I, um, I, uh, I was asked to be on the committee internally to help find a, um, uh, a commencement speaker for, this was my sophomore year, the commencement speaker for that graduating class that senior year. And my roommate was one of the guys graduating. And he came up to me one day and said, hey, I'm friends, my family's friends with Peter Jennings. Anybody here know who Peter Jennings is? Okay, Peter Jennings. Uh, everybody here know who Brian Williams is? <laughs> <laughs> Brian Williams, recently disgraced uh, NBC nightly news anchor. Well, the nightly news anchors, so Scott Pelley on CBS, you know, Brian Williams or Lester Holt, I should say, on NBC, for instance. So Peter Jennings at the time was the evening, was the, was the anchor of the ABC version of the nightly news their evening news broadcast. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I want the, I would definitely want this guy to be the commencement speaker. And for, well, my friend wanted him to be the commencement speaker because they go back to, like, Peter knows him since he's a child, right? So he can, so Peter, um, I walk into the president's office and say, I got, how about Peter Jennings? They're like, yes, of course. So we arranged Peter Jennings to come up to be the commencement speaker and um, he's gonna stay in our house we lived in Bonachores in this incredibly lavish beach house, which I can't, I still to this day can't believe those people rent them out to students. I mean, like, <laughs> nuts is that, right? Just, I mean, like, we had rooms we didn't know what to do with, except have parties in them. So, I mean, just nutty. So, uh, Peter comes up, and he, he's not going to stay in a hotel for the one night he's going to be here. He's going to stay in our house. And so he said to me, he said to P Andrew, my, my, uh, uh, <clears throat> my roommate, don't worry, I'll sleep on the couch. This is Peter Jennings, like world famous bajillionaire anchor. No, he's not going to sleep. So I said to him, no, Peter, you're going to have my room with my bed, and you're going to have your own room. And he said, well, that's very generous of you. I couldn't kick you out of your bed. And I said, no, 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 you can kick me out of your bed because in two years I'm going to graduate. And with a journalism degree, and I'm going to need a job. <laughs> and even though I wanted to go into print, I was looking, I'll, I'll, I was looking for any help I could get, because it's tough. It's a tough world. So he said, you got it. So he slept in my bed. Sure enough, I graduated. I called Peter Jennings' office, ABC in New York, and said, this is, my name's Adam Weiner. I'm trying to reach Peter. Jennings and uh, a friend of Andrew McKenzie. Hope that means something to you. And uh, the woman said, "I'll take your information." Two minutes later, Peter calls me back. He said, "Of course I remember you. I'm going to talk to some folks internally." I got a job as an intern, unpaid intern, which they don't really have anymore. Unpaid interns, I think, because it's against, I think it's against the law. Um, and uh, in their special events unit for a short-term project working and covering the, the Pope at that time was going to come to America. So they were going to do a big special. And there was a big two-hour long special about the Pope visiting America. And so like two months before, they were kicking it off with a special unit to gather all the information and all the research and tape and all the things they needed. And I started working in broadcast and I loved it. And I was like, this is really fascinating. I never considered broadcast when I was in college. It was all about the written word for me. And, uh, but this is really fascinating. The people here are really interesting and smart and they're doing some fun stuff and they have, a, they have big budgets. They could do things here. And so I went, you know what, this is the sort of life I think I could see myself in. Well, the show aired, I got a credit, and uh, that was it. And I was out of a job the next day. They didn't, have, they didn't have space for me. They actually went through a reduction just at that time and uh, a couple of desk assistants in other areas lost their jobs, so they weren't gonna hire, they, they didn't have a spot for me. In fact, people in entry-level jobs were losing 
their, uh, their jobs as, as I was finishing that internship. Um, but I was able to get into, get my resume into CBS where I had an uncle working, key uncle working. He was a uh, lighting director, so he wasn't really a journalism person per se. He wasn't on the editorial side, but he knew the people to send my resume around to. So CBS News. Anybody know who that guy is? That's Walter Cronkite. That's actually uh, him delivering the information about the death of President John F. Kennedy. Uh, he looks a little somber there, and he should be. Um, but what's interesting about this photo is um, the newsroom that he is sitting in, what was at CBS called the old TV newsroom, actually, before it was a TV newsroom, before TV existed, it was the radio newsroom. And when they finally built a proper TV newsroom for, for him, he moved into that, and it returned to being just the radio newsroom, and I was hired into that newsroom. So the magnitude of the, of the scope of this thing was really fascinating to me that I'm working in this place where this guy delivers news like Man on the Moon and the death of the president. I mean, just fascinating. And it was a real opportunity. Network radio news and, but why did I get the job? And it wasn't really because of my uncle. He got the resume in front of the right people, but can anyone guess why I got the job? Did you call every week? <laughs> I didn't call every week. It was, it was only one week, so I, uh, yes, I did call. It was only one week because I had computer skills. And that was something that they needed. They had newsroom computers now, and they needed people who understood them. And here I show up with all my resume having listed that I had a personal computer in 1978. That was something that, like, the woman who did the hiring said, you're in. We need to hire three people. You're the first one. And the other people being hired more on their, uh, some of their other talents, you're being hired because you have the skill and the fact that you have a journalism background and the fact that you worked at ABC News briefly. That's all helpful. But really, it's about the fact that we need people who understand the So back there, that, that Apple II, continuing to help. CBS News, I then went, I worked briefly in the newsroom, the network radio newsroom for about a year or so, and then I moved into the TV newsroom, Dan Rather set right over there. And uh, I worked on the foreign desk, CBS News, she alluded to briefly. I worked the overnights, I worked every shift known to man, um, and I didn't care. Even when I worked in radio, I didn't care. I wanted to work. I wanted to work and I wanted to make a name for myself. I would be there early, I would stay late. I wanted people to know who I was and that was critical. And that is a life lesson I can absolutely tell you that when you first graduate and you're first getting into your, your life, you are not gonna have the sort of responsibilities and ties that you're gonna have later. Kids, mortgages, relationships, healthcare, aging parents, whatever it might be. That's the moment where you can devote every ounce of your energy and you'll have no repercussions from friends or family. They'll understand. That's the moment where you can devote every resource you have to building that name and trying to get in front of people and showing the dedication and showing the interest. So I was there always as much as I could be there. If a story broke and I wasn't there, the very first thing that went through my mind was, I've got to get to the newsroom. How do I get to the newsroom? What's the fastest way to get to the newsroom? I was at my parents' house watching basketball one night, and this is like two hours from the city, and suddenly there's a picture-in-picture -in, -picture in the basketball finals, and it's a white Bronco being chased on this highway. And I'm like, oh my god, I gotta get back to New York. <laughs> when I was working on the foreign desk, I worked in amazing stories. I was on the foreign desk for three years. No domestic news <laughs> happened in three years. Zero. Fall of the Berlin Wall, Tiananmen Square, First Gulf War, Nelson Mandela were released. These are all major, major, major stories. And I was working in the right place at the right time. And that was key. Those are fascinating stories to coordinate and cover. I went to London for a little while. Um, and those stories were 
fascinating, there was one domestic story actually, and that domestic story was there was an earthquake in California. I came in, I was working the overnight, newsroom still hot, Dan Rather still on the air at midnight, East Coast time. I'm like, what do I have? I'm out. I'm gonna go in the back, put my feet up, I'm like, you know what, I, all those other stories, you guys got this one. So I sit, I'm sitting in the room, three people come running in, the governor of California is in Germany. I'm like, can I get one story where I don't have to participate in one? Turns out he had already left to come home, so I couldn't. <laughs> that still helped a little bit. Um, my next step at CBS was to work in the polling unit. 1992 campaign. There was a guy from Arkansas who ran I mean, Bill Clinton. And uh, be the first to raise your hand, always. What do I mean? The day it was announced in 1991 at CBS News, who was going to be the person leading the political unit for the upcoming election cycle? The day it was announced, an hour after that announcement, I saw that person walking through the newsroom. I practically tackled her. <laughs> her name is Susan Zarinsky. She's now, for many years, the executive producer of 48 Hours, and still a good friend of mine. She, um, anybody here see the movie Broadcast News? No, I recommend it. It was the main character is a woman in Holly, uh, played by Holly Hunter. That character is based on Susan Zarinsky. Holly Hunter followed Susan around CBS News for about a month to research the part. So I was the very first person to tell her I wanted to be part of this unit. I think everybody was trying to figure out how they were going to approach her and what they were going to say, and I didn't care. I was like, well, we're doing a China shop. I'm coming right in and saying it, I'm in. So I had developed a reputation enough already, being, as I said, always there and caring, that she knew who I was, and I was the first person chosen. Not only was I the first person chosen, but I was given the plumest of assignments when they made the announcements as to what people were going to go cover what candidates. I was given Mario Cuomo, who was at that point the governor of New York and without a doubt the front runner for the Democratic uh, presidential nomination. They made all the assignments to everybody. I was given the plum one. And the next day, he drops out of the race. <laughs> so Susan came to me and said, I, I, I don't know what to do. I'm sorry. You know, I'll, I can't take something away from somebody else and give it to you. But there is one guy we didn't assign yet, and that's a guy named Pat Buchanan, who is a super right-wing Republican uh, TV personality, former speechwriter for Nixon. And we would, we could put you on him. You know, the, the sexy stuff was the Democrat side because the Democrats were going to be a really interesting race leading to who was going to face most likely the incumbent president, Republican, of George Bush, uh, the dad. And um, so I said, sure, I'll, I guess I'll take Buchanan. Well, Buchanan team actually turned out to be the lead story coming out of the New Hampshire primary because he got 34% of the vote against the seated incumbent in his own party which was a major story. So the story um, after the New Hampshire primary was not who won from the Democratic side, the big story was the Republican. But eventually he faded, and eventually I got put on Clinton, Gore, and then Clinton, and, um, and I got one of these. This thing right here. This is gold. This was paper gold. We were handed these, CBS News was known for creating their political directory every election cycle for the president, presidential election. This was so coveted, it was, people would have them stolen, uh, people would be offered a lot of money, I was offered money for mine. You never let this out of your sight. It was, it was had every contact of every person you ever would want to reach. It was the, it was the Bible. It had the it, it issue, uh, talked about the issues. It was really, this was it. And I still have it, and this, I'll probably put it on eBay and make money. So no one can touch that, but I'm showing it to you here. If you want to touch it, you can't touch it. <laughs> um, during that time in New Hampshire, actually, as Linda mentioned, she brought up some students to talk to me. 
I think I, I, it was a freezing <coughs> cold day. It's always freezing. It's always yeah, even in summer. I think. It was freezing cold. We met on the street. I mean, it was like, and they, I talked to folks there a little bit, but I was, I think it was too cold to say anything, but we talked a little bit. Um, so, always raise your hand. Jump in. Just jump in. Both feet just jump in. I'm going to try to move through here so we have some time for questions. But the next thing I did was uh, up to the minute, which was the overnight news broadcast of CBS. Um, uh, so I worked the overnights for about four and a half years. Uh, it's amazing that my wife or my and my family uh, still love me. I became this wretched asshole. Uh, as you can see in '92, I'm sort of just full of myself, thrilled, happy. By '96. After working the overnight for several years, I'm like, I'm, a, I'm like a loose cannon, <laughs> angry. I probably had that. I've been up since probably six o'clock the night before. That probably was taken eight in the morning, and I was just, can we get this over with? You know, I was just, my temper was sky high, and my fuse was super short. Um, but I paid my dues, and in an organization like CBS, that is critical, right? Be, doing all these other things I've done before was paying my dues as well, but working the overnight, day in day out. Creating content for, you know, we had about 700,000 people who watched every night, which is a lot, actually, when you think about it. Um, but it wasn't the evening news at the time with 10 plus million. So in the organization, it was sort of like, but the cool thing was we worked overnight so I could do whatever the hell I wanted. I mean, I did stories about, I did a 10 minute thing about Burma. It would never have been on anything else. I mean, I just did whatever, whatever I wanted, I felt like doing. Uh, but we, but the key thing was, one of the key things was we, Think about that time frame, 92 to like 97. The internet is like, just exploding. It's this new thing. And we did a deal with a guy who wanted to start this new magazine called Wired. We'll have you on TV, we'll do some stuff with you. We'll do, we're gonna, we're gonna review CD-ROMs every week. I mean, it was like, we, we, we started doing all these segments about the internet. We started getting mail, actual mail, because people didn't have email back then. Actual mail from people thanking us they would set their alarm. Every Thursday, I set my alarm for 2.48 in the morning so I can wake up and watch your digital drive segment. I mean, it was unbelievable to me. So we started, we, and we created what was the first website of any network news broadcast, UTTM.com. I remember going to the legal team at, and marketing team at CBS and saying, I, I'm, we're going to create a website. And they're like, what? What's a website? And, and we need to use the marks and logos of CBS on the website. And they said, uh, OK. I can't believe they still let us do it. We did it for free because everybody gave us all their technology for free because they thought we'd talk about them on the air. Um, but, uh, but having that experience in the website creation and creating that content led to when CBS decided they actually needed to actually create a website, a real website, for cbsnews.com, I was pulled out of the broadcast world to be the executive producer of that site as it launched. Well, um, most of the people we hired were from, from outside the company because nobody internally knew anything about the website except for a handful of us uh, about the internet. So, But I ran this newsroom and um, Many of you have no idea what this is, but everybody used to get CD-ROMs in the mail to get free hours on America Online. America Online in the late 90s was like, that was it. That was the internet. It's sort of like, it's sort of come full circle. It's like how everybody spends time on, well, I know people in this room probably spend most of their time on like things like Snapchat and Instagram, but you know, Facebook is this monstrous thing and whether or not you want to admit you're on it or not, you're on it, I know you are. And a lot of people spend time on Facebook it's, Facebook is sort of like what AOL was then. Everybody's on it all the time. AOL was it. And we at CBS News were so far behind all of our competitors, we needed distribution. We needed eyeballs. So back then, I'm working in a newsroom. I only have a journalism backup. I have no idea of the way the business world really works. And I call, I pick up the phone and I call a guy I know at AOL who works there. And I said, who runs your news department? Next thing I know, they take a call from the guy at CBS, sure. 
CBS News, of course, take a call from you. But the next thing I know, I'm in sort of in the middle of a deal that's between AOL and CBS that is a, a promotional thing where we're going to promote AOL on all our news broadcasts. They're going to use CBS exclusively as their broadcast provider in their news stuff. And I realized now, right now, if I needed to get more distribution or more eyeballs into onto my website, I would turn to a guy who runs business development for me and say, make it happen. Or audience development for me. These are actual positions. And I would say, make it happen. I had no those words I didn't know they went together back then. <laughs> so I just made some calls like any network producer or journalist would do. I picked up the phone and called people. And I learned about how the deal making worked. And I said to myself, well, I could do that. I could do that. And that's really interesting. And the internet is exploding. <laughs> so I'm going to do that. So I left CBS News. And I went to go work for Office.com, which is actually an CBS investment property. They actually, it was a, it was a joint uh, effort between CBS and a company called Windstar. And there were some things that were said around the time I was leaving, uh, and my decision to leave was sort of predicated also on the fact that I didn't really like the direction that CBS was going in with its internet stuff. And rather than say some of the things I wished I could have said to people, I didn't. And that would have been burning bridges. And I didn't say it. And I, I, I stewed on some stuff. And I said, you know what? Don't say it. Take the high road. Move on. There's other opportunities and other things and other places and people. So I left. And some of those people I still deal with today. On a personal level, on a professional level, and it all comes full circle. So whenever you think about saying something to someone that it could be harsh, don't. You never know the help you might need later or the help that they might need later. And everybody, it all comes full circle, all of it. I am showing you this photo of office.com for one reason only. We had a blimp. <laughs> we had a blimp. I mean, talk about the excesses of the dot-com era. That's it. I mean, can you believe we had a blimp? The marketing department determined, yeah, a great marketing spend for us is to put, our, put the, the logo on a blimp. I mean, what is that, nuts? I mean, yeah, good year. It's a tradition. But all this stuff, come on. <laughs> then I spent 10 years in the desert, just like in the Bible. 40 days in the desert, okay. 10 years ago. Uh, and I don't want to say the desert, because I learned a lot. I left office.com. I eventually was the general manager, not editorial, the general manager of a company called Healthology, a health media startup. We got purchased by iVillage. Anybody here know iVillage? It was a women's portal. It was really the first and most important and huge. iVillage was then swallowed up by NBC Universal. So I found myself at NBC Universal. And I was chief operating officer of iVillage for a brief moment. I was um, head of business development search and commerce for the website. So these are not editorial roles at all. These are business roles. And I was able to do it. You know, when I was at Healthology, I used to joke to the guy who was the CEO, I'm like, I got my JD at the University of Healthology because I was negotiating contracts nonstop. I was, uh, suddenly I, I could read a representations and warranty section of a, of a contract and understand it, which still baffles me to this day. It's nothing you really want to do, just so you know, but I, I can do it. Um, and then eventually I left, I wound up leaving NBC to go to an investment property of NBC, sort of like when I left CBS to go to an investment property of CBS, a startup called Driver TV. And it was a great business, great business model, fantastic, and there was just this one little issue with the car industry a couple years ago, which I remember GM went bankrupt and responsible for 75% of our revenue. Easy to do the math there, so I left and I went to go work at a Dow Jones and IAC. IAC is an interactive corporation owned by a guy named Barry Diller. Uh, they don't use like Match.com, uh, Ask.com, uh, College Humor was one of its sites. Uh, and they created a joint uh, effort called Phi Life. And the guy I worked with at 
who hired me at Filife, who was the general manager, was a guy I worked for at Ivanich. That guy left Filife to go work at CBS. And he called me and he, well, he called me into his office and says, I'm going to go to CBS to start something new there. I know you know a lot of people. Would you want to go? And I was like, well, I need to know what's changed because I left there for very specific reasons. So he explained to me those changes. And so now this is what I do. What do I do now? I, for those who don't know, my incredibly long and convoluted title is Senior Vice President of Content, Community, and Operations for CBS Local. What is CBS Local? It's the biggest thing you don't know. CBS Local is the digital extensions <coughs> of all of the owned and operated TV and radio stations of CBS. Does anyone here know the difference between t an owned and operated station and an affiliate? Anybody? Okay. WPRI in, uh, in Providence is a CBS station. It is not a CBS station. It is a CBS affiliate. It is owned by a company called Media General, which owns a lot of TV stations and radio stations. But they don't, but that is not a site, that is not a station owned by CBS. They affiliate themselves with CBS. They pay CBS money to get their network programming and use the marks and logos in their sales and marketing collateral. That's what they do. And so CBS, but CBS owns stations as well. And these are all of them. There's a lot. And they're all in the biggest markets. A couple outliers like Riverside or uh, you know, St. Louis. To me, those are small cities, right? But we're in the biggest cities. So let's look at CBS New York, for instance, right? Channel 2. Anybody here from New York? Channel 2. Channel 55, TV. 1010 wins, 880. News radio. 660, 660 WFAN, sports radio. Amp radio pop, fresh 1027. Uh, oldies FM. All CBS owned. Right? Of course, CBS is the flag, and New York is the flagship, and almost all of them are on a site called cbsnewyork.com, and that's the site that I'm responsible for. All of these brands here, CBS LA, CBS Boston, and there's a couple of national brands as well. Radio.com is a brand that I'm responsible for. If you go download the Radio.com app, you can listen to the streams of these, a lot of these stations. It is the direct competitor to iHeart. For many of you know iHeart. It's big. This is a big entity. It's that big. If 70 million people a month come to those websites, that's a lot of people all over the country. 27 million hours of streaming a month. It's a lot. We're the number three streamer in the US. We have YouTube and iHeart. It's just gigantic. And that's what I do. Reach is the name of the game now. For any of you going into uh, any kind of communications field, it's about websites, it's about broadcast, all of these things, or print, it's all about how many people you reach, because that determines your ad rates. Finally, who is Modern Renew? Jack Thompson. Remember Jack Thompson? Yeah. Jack Thompson was a journalism professor here, and uh, I fancied myself a creative writer one day. And I started doing, I took a creative writing class, and he knew, I guess, the professor from the creative writing class, and I told him that I was doing taking that guy's thing. And so Jack read one of my pieces that I submitted for the creative writing class. And one day I walked into class, and this envelope he hands me. And I wrote all my creative writing stuff under my pen name. Pretty, pretty sneaky. Modern Renew, which was basically my name backwards. And so this was waiting for me from Jack. I always, I wanted to go into journalism. I focused on journalism. I never changed my major. It was what I wanted to do. Don't get sidetracked. 
plus his message here. Keep your eye on the prize and go. Thanks, Dad. Or his savage. <laughs> That's it. I want to say thanks. Really thanks. Questions, if you have any, if not, you can all go on. <laughs> so you mentioned in your bio that you like kids that put out podcasts, right? Do you think that shows self-starting? Um, the past three weeks, I've actually been in the middle of doing that with a friend. We just finished our first feature, and we're in editing and doing some advertising stuff and all that. But what is what are some tips or anyone you could put me in contact with? <laughs> to help me out? Um, well, tips, you know, production value helps, right? As I used to tell people when shooting video, if they can't hear it, it doesn't matter how good the video is, right? How many times have you tried to watch a video and the audio sucked? You'll turn right off. You want to, you want to understand what they're saying, the message, right? So, and that means what I'm talking about basically from a production standpoint, just make sure the audio is top notch, the quality of the audio is best you can get. Try not to make it sound like it's underwater or muffled in any way. Pump it up as best you can. And then really it is truly about the content. Now that's really what it's about. It's about your personality or your partner's personality, playing off each other, dialogue, what are you talking about, having an opinion. Something I tell the folks who work uh, in my world all the time, because I'm responsible for a lot of them, right? So I tell people all the time who work in sports and music, I tell them you have an unbelievable advantage over the people who work in hard news, and that is that you can give your opinion. Have an opinion, right? If you gave your opinion on the newscast, you are out of a job the next day. Right? But if you give your opinion on a sports radio station, it's just more banter. If you give your opinion on a, on a morning show of a, radio, of a music station, it's just banter. Op-ed columns, uh, written text, that stuff is gold. That is what people react to. When we started to create CBS Locals Network, we created a section for the best of. So if you go to cbsboston.com or cbsnewyork.com, you would see a section called best of. And it's like the 10 best pizza places. In New York, right? It's like search gold. People always search pizza in New York, right? Whatever they're searching for, right? Well, when they started to create those lists and they came out, the first couple were being produced, I said, you better leave off one of the really obvious ones. And they looked at me like I had two heads. And I went, no, you want people reacting. You want people demanding how stupid you are for leaving off that goddamn pizza place they love. And then guess what? In a year or six months, you can add it and say, thanks for that, you were right. And then take off another one. <laughs> it's about the content. Yeah. So as far as getting people to hear it, if it's great content, people will find it. Because working social channels, and it's about social media now, working social channels to get people to listen to it, pleading with people to listen to it, giving snippets of the opinion in social, and say, hear it here, and find out how I answered this, or find out how I reacted, we might pique interest to people, and they might share, and that is how you get distributed. Um, but you gotta, it's gonna come down to good content first. I mean, I'll gladly take a listen. Whether or not I can help you is a whole other story. Um, I, I, find, I find it interesting that, um, you know, you are very into computers from an early age, and, you know, your focus is also heavy on print journalism when you were doing journalism, but um, I was just wondering, you know, based on that, how you feel the state of journalism is today? Uh, we live in a, the most amazing time for journalism right now. I mean, the democratization of publishing has occurred in our lifetimes. The ability for anybody to put something out there, that wasn't, that didn't exist, you know? 
You wanted to get on, you wanted to get your, you wanted to, on the spot news in fourth grade didn't get distributed outside the, that classroom, right? But now, something like that could have been like a viral hit. Like, look at these kids with this crazy thing they did. I mean, this is the most amazing time. And I, I, I feel lucky that I was able to live through the birth of, this, of the internet because it changed everything. And especially journalism, it changed the publishing. But the one thing I will say is it still comes down to the quality of reporting and the quality of sourcing at the root. I mean, you can spout your opinion about your favorite football team, but if you're going to report on facts about about uh, the hard news story, nothing's changed. It's all about those basic questions and confirmation and avoiding hearsay and avoiding third party. Is it hard to keep on top of all of the stories that are coming out since we have like Twitter and Facebook that just post things so quickly? Is it hard to you know, stay on top of the most current and interesting story? For me? Yeah. Um, well, I have an organization huge organization where the stuff will bubble up fast. It's really that important. Um, I mean, Twitter is Twitter's the greatest invention of all time. In my opinion. It's just amazing. Amazing. Um, but it's, it's like the radio. To me. Um, and what I mean by that is you don't turn on the radio and hit the reverse rewind button. It's whatever is right now. I, I, if you try to stay current on Twitter, you'll lose your mind. Right? It's just when I happen to glance at it, that's when I will see. But like, you know, if I see things getting retweeted a lot or that sort of thing, I mean, that's obviously going to be red flags. But I have, I have people who work within my organization where that's, that stuff will bubble up fast. It's, sure, it's hard to stay on top of it. Even just, just in my world, it's hard to stay on top of it. With all those publishing entities that I just said and broadcast outlets, I mean, we're, you know, we're producing tens of thousands of pieces of content a month. I mean, I, I can't read all that. And I'm responsible for it. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, um, I live and breathe it. I mean, it's from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed. I know you spoke a lot about um, journalism and everything like that, but how uh, important do you feel uh, the use of journalism, public relations, and like communication in your position like, at CBS in general? Yeah, public relations uh, and communications is a key element for us. So, um, you know, CBS is a, uh, is a very successful company. And for any company, controlling the message is very important, right? So. Uh, a lot of the PR, I wouldn't say a lot, but there is, there is PR work that is done at any news organization or any, dis or any distributed news organization like a, like a CBS um, uh, or a Gannett or any of these big ones that, um, you know, you're, sometimes you're chasing, um, it's like damage control sometimes. But in a lot of ways, a lot of times it is important just because uh, the, the, the information that we put out on a daily basis through press or press notifications, as I like to call them, and those are full-fledged press releases, but more of just like notifications to um, specific groups of, of, uh, of, of topic-related outlets. So if we wanted to just reach the internet media, um, the media that covers internet media, is a very minute thing, right? It's like, but I'll work through the press channels to say, you want to, you want to let them know that we're doing this thing. You know, that's that's you know. So we we just released a brand new app, say, this past week called Pingo, and it's basically um, it is a people taking photos like you would for Instagram or whatever, and filling out like a bingo card with photos. And brands are getting involved, and artists are getting involved, and it's a fun, it's a fun game. It sort of gamifies photo taking. Well, we wanted to get the information out there that this was available, right? So there was a big article in Ad Age 
about the launch of Pingo because it's specifically helping brands in certain ways who can create their own challenges. So that story was a direct result of our PR department talking to the reporters at Ad Age to say, hey, you should consider this. We just released this thing. This is a cool thing. Check it out. And it led to a story. So press the PR and communications piece is really critical for us to showcase that we are evolving technologically and, and editorially, product-wise. Um, your current career seems to be more on the, uh, the business side and the admin side of things. Do you miss the, the reporting and research and the journalism side of um, I, I do. There was a time where I didn't. So uh, I can tell you that there was a moment where I really, I really burned out. Uh, and I remember the exact moment when I burned out. And it was, I had just gotten in bed. I was in baby, maybe in bed an hour. It was back when I was executive producer of CBSNews.com. And the guy who worked in the newsroom called me and said, hey, CNN just said something about Frank Sinatra that you may be interested in knowing. I said, yeah, what is it? Well, it looks like he was taken to uh, Cedar sinai in LA, and I don't know, they're reporting that it might be bad. Well, he was dead. And I thought to myself, I've got to get up and go to work because of old man died. I mean, he's not just any old man. And I loved his music. I, loved, and I still do. I still play it to this day. I love it. Especially his stuff with Jogi, if you guys. <laughs> um, but I remember that moment thinking, damn, I can't believe it. Like, this is like... And remember before I said how my first thought was always, gotta get the loser. That was the first time where I didn't think that. And I realized it immediately. And I said to myself, uh, that's not a good sign. Well, uh, two years later, I'm working sort of in a business role capacity now. And I'm still in editorial, but it's, it's more business focused. And 9-11. Uh, uh, and that was when I thought, you know, I sort of miss it. This would be the moment where I would be working hard. But I sort of don't also because I'm working towards this new course sort of career. So, but that was the first time where I sort of, I felt the pangs again of like, it's such a big story and it's the story of our lifetime. You know, I, you know, the fact that I'm missing this because I don't work in hard news now is, is a strange thing. All right, we have time for one more question. Somebody that's um, in this class, please. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of your CBS career that you were at the right place at the right time. Was there ever a story that you were uncomfortable with or didn't report? That you were uncomfortable with or refused to report on? No. I can tell you one story, though, that is completely depressing that changed my life. I, I don't want to say it was uncomfortable from a it was not really uncomfortable from a reporting perspective and the fact that it was it had to be reported, but it was uncomfortable from a personal thing and it really changed. It changed my view of news. And it was about two years into CBS and I was working the 2 a.m. shift uh, in the TV newsroom helping the radio newsroom. So basically radio would call me and be like, TV got the sound from someone you need to go and get the tape and we make sure we get a copy of it so that we can put it on the radio. And I wake up and I go to work and I walk in and at 2 in the morning, everybody's still there from the day, which is never a good sign. And it was Pan Am 103. Um, and I immediately got a call, because they've been waiting for me to come in, and I immediately got a call and they're like, they're, there's sound, there's tape that TV has down in this edit room that they just got of families at JFK finding out about their loved ones who are on that plane. You need to go get that tape for us. And I walked into the edit bay, and as I walked in, I looked at the screen, and the parents of one of my best friends is on the screen. And I knew right then 
that she was dead. And she was a student at Syracuse University, which had a, a large contingent of people who went to London for, and they were all coming back on that same flight, and a whole bunch of them died. And she was a vivacious, fantastic person. I loved her, incredible. Theo Cohen, God rest her soul, incredible person. Um, and her parents, she was an only child, it was, and I, I had to get it together, and I had to work, and I had to get it done. And I knew there would be a time at some point later for me to grieve and deal with it. But right then I had to work. And I realized right then that every story touches so many people. I'm not her immediate family. I'm a friend of hers from her childhood, right? I'm not a close friend anymore during her college years. We sort of drifted a little bit. But still, you know, she was a friend of mine growing up. I mean, you know, we played together and and I realized like that extended circle of people is immense. And so to a story like that, or any story, touches so many people. And for me not to lose sight of that in every story moving forward was critical. Absolutely critical. And uh, that was the only uncomfortable thing I think I can tell you about. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. out of here. Now, right. we mentioned that you wanted to go to the store, but oh, yeah, well. we've got the sweater <laughs> 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 so thank you. Thank you. And we also have a little portfolio for you as well. Thank you. Feels really happy. Thank you again. <laughs> Oh, if I had this earlier, I would have worn it to the uh, to the A10 tournament, which I went to to watch you arrive. And I saw them advance to the GW, and then I saw them. Oh. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Zach, you don't even go to the... I was joking. What do you mean? What was that? Uh, yeah, you know,